Spotlighting youth activism and highlighting individual initiatives, this session aims to inspire more young people to take action for the SDGs in their own communities. Let's dive into these SDG micro projects. Hello, global citizens. It's nice to see you all. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 See you. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, hello to everyone listening and joining us today at the SDG Action Zone. It is such a joy to join you um, as a program officer at the Ban Ki Moon Center for Global Citizens. So, my name is Julia. Um, and today I'm joined by five expert speakers, which I would going to introduce you to in just a moment. But first, let me give you a little bit about um, what the Ban Ki-moon Center is. So the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens uh, was founded in 2018 by the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, um, and the former president of Austria, so the 11th president of Austria, Heinz Fischer. And their goal was to empower youth and women within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, which of course were established um, while Ban Ki-moon was Secretary General in 2015. So with that framework, we have many programs and projects that we do, two of which are scholarship and fellowship programs. And the representatives that I am lucky enough to be joined with today are from those programs. Uh, we have three of our former scholars and two of our former fellows. And they're going to be sharing with you how they've changed the game uh, with SDG micro projects in their communities. So I'm very, very excited. Our scholarship program today, we have uh, three members of the former cohorts of our scholarship program, Al Hassan, Belinda, and Oyinda. And we also have two members of our women's empowerment program, one from our Asian cohort, Farida, and one from our GCC cohort, Latifa. So what is an SDG micro project? Just before I introduce our first speaker, an SDG micro project is a project that addresses one or more of the SDGs uh, in a specific community. So all of these individuals that are speaking today have a, developed a project for their specific community, regional context. And sometimes these projects also have a bigger regional focus or a global focus as well. So that is the SDG micro project. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the panel, and that is Al-Hassan Muniru. Al-Hassan is a Global Citizen Scholar from 2018 of the Ban Ki-moon Center. He's an enthusiastic social entrepreneur from Ghana, and his SDG micro project was conducted in partnership with the uh, NGO that he, or startup that he founded, Recycle Up Ghana, and it is an incubator for young entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. A little bit, a little interesting um, hint about Al Hassan is he was recognized by Green Biz and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development as part of the 2019 class of 30 under 30 for sustainability. So Al Hassan, welcome. It's so great to see you. Um, we're going to start and kick this off right away. Uh, how did you manage? Uh, how did you? What problem did you see in your community? Um, and how did you manage to address it? Thanks for the awesome introduction, uh, Julia. So my country, Ghana, is a beautiful country blessed with enormous natural and human resources. However, our country is drowning in waste, which is leading to adverse societal consequences such as flooding and waterborne diseases like malaria and cholera. At the same time, Ghana has a very high uh, youth population with over 44% of, of the nation's population being below 40 years. At Recycle, for, for me and my, my friends, we decided to see how best we can tackle the challenges. And that's why we created the organization Recycle Up Ghana with the mission to empower the next generation of change makers who will work together to help make a difference in society. What we did was to organize a summer camp for high school students and to enable them to become Recycle Lab ambassadors. Fast forward to um, four years afterwards, we saw the need to use entrepreneurship to solve societal challenges. And that's how we, we came up with the Recycle Lab Incubator project, which seeks to support young people to come up with um, ideas and businesses which promote circularity, thereby leading to the reduction of waste in society, but at the same time also empowering these young people to make something for themselves. 
And so that's what we've done at Recycle Lab uh, Ghana and also with the Recycle Lab Incubator program. Wonderful, that's, that's great to hear. And the incubator was um, initially launched or proposed um, when you were a scholar in 2018. So it's really exciting to see how far you've come. Why is this so important? Why is recycling, why is teaching about recycling, fostering new ideas for, for climate action so important? Because most of your work is centered around SDG, I'd say 13, so for climate action. Why is it important, especially for Ghana? Exactly. So for us at Recycle Lab Ghana, our approach is based on the philosophy that local problems must be solved by local people. And also we believe that young people are the current and future change makers and should be empowered to start acting now. And so we believe that we need to actually uh, collaborate with young people and, 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 and support them to be able to work on achieving the SDGs. And most especially also we know how waste issues affect society in general. And so by doing that, we'll be able to help achieve the SDGs and also empower young people to make a difference in society. And when we do that, we solve future problems as well. Wonderful. How do you think, because I'm sure some of our listeners today, so young activists just like yourself are wondering, you know, how can I replicate this idea? How can I start a recycling program in my community? So how could you recommend, what would you recommend for, for others that want to start such an initiative? Yeah, so for us at Recycle Up Ghana, our vision, our big vision is actually to see you recycle up the world. And so we, we have a, we are actually, we work remotely. We work with, um, with our colleagues in Germany, in Ghana, and also in other places. And actually we are, open to collaborating with people across, you know, from different countries. We are actually right now working on a, on a collaboration with two of our partners in Nigeria and one also in India to also help them set up Recycle Lab Nigeria and also Recycle Lab India. And so we are very much open to collaborating and supporting other people. We have done it, we have the blueprint, you know, everything has been documented. And so we actually want to see the, the, the movement becoming big and to see it spread all over the world because the issue of waste it's not only you know, central to developing countries, also developed countries are struggling with how to deal with waste. And we know its consequences you know, with global warming, with climate change and everything, it's all interconnected. And so we want to see this you know, all over the world and we want to recycle up the world. Great, thank you so much. And I suppose that everyone can find out more about Recycle Up via your website and your social media. So I encourage anyone interested to check that out. Exactly, we have Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter. We are in, on all the social media platforms. Just Google Recycle Up Ghana or you go on the Recycle Up Ghana website. You can see us and you can also write us an email and then we will very much be open to collaborating and, and working with you. Super, thank you, Ahasan. Thank so we've you. already heard from one of our scholars about a very exciting project that deals with SDG 13, uh, recycling, but also empowering young people to take charge of their own futures in their communities. And that recycling is not just a problem of the developing world, but of all of the world and something we all need to work on taking better care of our climate. With that, I'm ready to change to our next speaker. Our next speaker is from our scholarship cohort in 2019. So last year, Oyinda Adegboye, uh, she's from Nigeria, and she's a change catalyst who is passionate about strengthening Africa's human capital, especially through educating youth. Her SDG micro project, Common Futures Conversations, promotes dialogue between young people and policymakers all around the world. So I'm very excited. Oyinda, tell us what problem did you see in your community or maybe even outside of your community, so a bigger community, and how did you decide to solve it? Okay, thank you so much, Julia. It's really a pleasure to be here speaking with you on this topic. Um, like you already shared, the Common Futures Conversations Project seeks to connect young people in Europe and Africa with policymakers and also help them to develop their perspectives on global challenges. And the problem we found was quite um, um, complex, so to say. Um, generally, across the world, we know that many young people feel overlooked and excluded from their governments. Um, 
on the other, in Africa, for instance, um, there's a huge governance gap whereby, you know, the average adult state is about 64 years old, while the median age for, for, for the population is 19.4. In Europe, there's also um, a, an aging population which threatens to numerically exclude young people. And so there's obviously the sense of disconnect between young people and their governments. And another interesting problem we also found through a survey that we did at the launch of the project was that many young people are also not able to establish the connection between their local everyday realities with, in quotes, bigger global problems. So for instance, a young person in Nigeria that doesn't have a job or doesn't have access to um, education cannot really see the connection between that reality and say something like climate change. And so the problem we sought to solve was in three folds. First, um, how do we help young how do young people engage with politics currently and what issues matter most to them? And second, um, how can we develop innovative ways for them to engage with these issues critically? And thirdly, how can they even develop their perspective of these perspectives of these issues so that they can contribute meaningfully? And so what we sought to do was first we started, we had like a scoping and orientation process where young people themselves were brought on board. I was one of the founding members and um, country representative for Nigeria. And there was a scoping and orientation project and process where all, all young representatives from different countries came together to contribute to the design of the platform itself. So if you're saying young people should use this platform, then they should be you know, the ones co-creating and leading the design of that platform. Secondly, what the project also helped us to achieve was that, was that intergenerational dialogue, right? Because you see, we were able to connect young people you know, help them collaborate on ideas, refine these ideas, and then pitch them to global policymakers at a virtual event. And thirdly, of course, is the intercontinental um, connections that we're able to make, young people con connecting with their peers across the world and learning how to strengthen and develop their perspectives on issues that not only affected their countries, but had a global consequence. And so, um, yeah, that's how we've been working with young people across the world on this project. Wonderful, great. And why is this so important? When I'm listening to you, I know that it's related to SDG 1, it's related to SDG 13, like you said, climate change, it's related to a lot of the SDGs that are interlinked and also, of course, yes. SDG 16, good governance and policy. Why is it so important that young people have this platform? Um, thank you very much. I think it's important because we're beginning to realize that young people um, cannot continue to be excluded from issues that have to do with their current realities and even their futures. If we're talking about sustainable development, for anything to be sustainable, it means that there has to be provision for, for it to continue beyond a certain time, right? And so young people have to be at the forefront, co-designing, co-creating this, the, you know, the popular table we like to talk about. They should be there, right? Co-creating the tables, co-designing policies that affect their lives and um, influence their aspirations, they should be there at the forefront. And so this project is really important because um, we cannot continue to um, separate um, current realities that young people face from whoever, um, whatever processes influence or policies that influence the lives that they would live both now and in the future. So it's very important also for young people to not just have um, a micro perspective, so to say, about issues, but have a very informed and global perspective such that they're able to contribute meaningfully to their local realities, but also see how these connections, um, how these um, goals connect with global world goals. Yeah. Great, perfect. I'm sure that um, there's others that are interested in perhaps engaging with this platform that already exists or maybe trying to do something similar. Uh, what would be your recommendation for how it could be scaled or how it could be brought to other, other communities and regions? Thank you. So already um, the Common Futures Project actually seek to, in quotes, expand or go beyond the bubble. So um, as a young person, I feel like I've had access to certain spaces because of the quality of education I have had and the networks I have had access to. So what that project also sought to do was to help young people, you know, democratize opportunities, so to say. And so being a member of that platform, which is open to anybody wherever you are in the world, you know, you can join 
um, the Common Futures conversation, we are currently, you know, open for any young person that wants to join. And so we are also looking in the future to help young people who want to organize local projects in their community, support them with funding and resources that they would need to, you know, implement those projects. And of course, you know, encourage the most active members by inviting them to, you know, offline events, you know, held maybe at the Chatham House, which is quite recognized as a an international policy think tank. So those are ways that we think that young people can begin to, you know, take the forefront and drive change, you know, in their communities. Thank you so much, Ayinda. So everyone, if you've heard, we can find out more by going to Common Futures um, Conversations. Okay. It's the Chatham House um, also is a partner for this initiative, so please do go check it out. So our next uh, speaker today is Farida Amiri, and Farida is from our Global Citizen Fellowship cohort. She was from the first ever Women's Empowerment Program, which focused on Asian women. She is a peace activist and peace builder from Afghanistan. With her grassroots initiative, Peace Friends, she established youth and women-focused network mechanisms designed to promote and support peace-building activities, social gatherings within the context of Afghanistan, and her SDG micro project was in partnership with Peace Friends. Welcome, Farida. It is wonderful to have you with us. It would be wonderful if you could start by telling us what problem you saw in your community and how you went about solving it. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, I have to say that I was born in, in problem, meaning I was born in, in war. So uh, the life journey of myself and the life journey of my fellow young generations, particularly the peace builders, uh, uh, have started their, uh, their life with war. And, and unfortunately, it still continues with war. So uh, the outbreak and also the continuation of conflict and war uh, not only in my community where I live, but also across the country, uh, has been one of the key and core uh, problem in the country. So, uh, so uh, this this ongoing war has opened the door and has paved the way for so many other challenges and 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 problem. One of those key challenges or problem uh, can be the lack of uh, coexistence or uh, social harmony uh, among the community, particularly when it comes to uh, women and, and, and men. So uh, this is one of the huge problem in the field of peace building. So therefore, in order to address this issue and in order to uh, tackle this issue to some extent, uh, I and my uh, group members have gone for an initiative and have gone for an SDG micro project called Talk for Peace through uh, the initiative I'm running, uh, Peace Friends. So there we have provided the platform for the uh, particularly young women and men to, uh, uh, to go for a dialogue and somehow to, uh, to talk to each other in order to uh, solve the, the issue to some uh, extent. Thank you. Thank you. And I know already, but I'm sure our listeners are very curious to also learn why is it so important for young people, maybe even especially young women, to be involved in peace building in Afghanistan, but also elsewhere? Uh, thanks so much. This is, I think, a very vital question. Uh, uh, so uh, first of all, if we uh, include the young generation, uh, particularly young women in the peace building activities or peace building uh, process. So somehow we whether directly or indirectly address and tackle the issue of uh, coexistence, which is very important in order to step forward to implement or to raise awareness uh, about the implementation or I would say establishment of other SDGs particularly the SDG number four and SDG uh, number uh, number uh, five. So, so it paves the way uh, for the better or fully implementation of, uh, of uh, other uh, SDGs. And, and I do think that this is one of the very key important reason that, um, uh, that uh, there has to be taken steps uh, in terms of the implementation of uh, uh, SDG, SDGs when it comes to the gender and also uh, uh, peace building. 
Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. So SDG five for gender equality, SDG four for quality education. Um, and then, of course, centering very much around SDG 16, peace, justice and strong institutions all deal with peace friends and your work. Um, what would you say to others that would be interested in replicating what you've done in Afghanistan or scaling some type of work in peace building? What would be your advice to them? Thank you. Well, I would say when it comes to not only the field of peace building, but also other uh, activities or other uh, other initiatives that particularly young people around the world are, are, are running, uh, network is the key uh, is the key to to success uh, of uh, such initiatives or or uh, projects. So I think. Uh, building network and maintaining the network among the not only on the national level but also uh, at the international level can help us a lot and fortunately we do see that the technology has helped us to somehow make the world world smaller for ourselves so we are so uh, open to the collaboration and also integration of other people particularly when they come when when they come from the uh, conflict zone uh, context context so uh, fortunately uh, we are actively engaged through the young people through the social media platforms twitter facebook and instagram so they are most welcome to join us through uh, the uh, social media platforms uh, through peace friends pages Perfect. Thank you so much, Farida, for this um, very important uh, statement and for sharing a bit also about your, your own personal experience. That's very appreciated. Our next speaker is Latifa al -Watsan. And Latifa is also an alumna of our fellowship program of the GCC cohort. Latifa is a social entrepreneur in the field of education from Kuwait. In her work, she applies engaging methodologies to integrate the SDGs into every level of education. Her SDG micro project supported young students in building a solar energy powered greenhouse in the backyard of a public school in Kuwait, which sounds wonderful. So Latifa, thank you so much for joining us today. Tell us what problem did you see in your community and how did you go about solving it? Um, I would like to start off by saying thank you for having me. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the project that I was working on. I'll tell you more about the background. So as you mentioned, um, uh, education is my passion. I do it because I truly believe that the core of reaching out to any individual is at schools. It's where we uh, all go, whether it was a formal or informal education, uh, no matter which country we lived in, we all receive some form of education. So that's key. If you educate the teacher, if you uh, work well on upon the school that, the, uh, that your children are going to, then you will be capable of fixing a lot of the societal problems that you might be facing in the future. Now, the problem that um, I saw was that I've been working, as I said, in education for a while. I've also been working uh, volunteering in a bridge training program where we bridge youth who go to high schools and then uh, when they start going to universities. And of course, over the past two years, I've been specifically working with high school graduates. And you get to see what majors they would like to uh, major in when they go to university. And coming from uh, Kuwait, country uh, that's basically a desert, and you get to see... Um, how the country is and the agriculture that we have in Kuwait. Plus, I'm very interested in the environment and I'm very active in that field as well. I have my own uh, beach cleanup initiative and environmental awareness initiative. And working all these two things together, uh, working with, the, with youth and getting to see the problems that build up, because I truly don't believe that things are not interconnected and I'm pretty sure everybody knows so. So when we get to see the interconnections between everything, and as I explained, education being the core of the solution, then if we want to tackle a problem, then why not tackle it at school at an age where the children would be uh, perceptive and yet they would still have time uh, to change the course of their lives. So I started at an elementary school um, where, of course, it's an all-female school. I, I don't need to point out that I'm a woman myself. And this it puts even more pressure on, on us trying to prove ourselves in, in, 
in fields that have been usually taken over by men, like especially in the field of engineering and agriculture and anything that has to do with planting, especially uh, where I come from um, around the world. So I thought, you know what, uh, girls are not interested in or they don't, and they're not very much aware of the different types of engineering, like solar energy engineering, agriculture engineering, uh, the very serious problems that we're faced with in terms of import, depending on imports for um, for produce, uh, for lo local production, for food security, working in factories, manufacturing, and all of these things. This is very very important. So the project that I worked on was literally to show everybody and show these little girls that it's possible for you, being a woman, to plant, to put your hands in the soil, to get dirty, if you know what I mean, and um, to go ahead and plant. So what we did was we created two different types of green uh, areas in the school. In the break uh, break area, in the break room areas, we had uh, we planted the the gardens in the break in the break okay in the yards uh, with the fr uh, fresh vegetables that the kids can eat. And then right at the at the front of school, it's within the school uh, walls. We created a solar house that is basically a greenhouse that is powered by solar energy now of course i couldn't do it all on my own uh, i had help and which is very important and it's very key to have stakeholders and collaborators working with you so i had help from uh, one of my friend engineers abdel hadi uh, who has been amazing throughout the whole project um, and what we did was he worked with the girls he came to school they saw him they built the greenhouse with him and they looked at how uh, they can go ahead and turn this into a solar uh, a solar energy kind of uh, uh, system. Of course, we can talk about it more um, on social media or you can uh, visit us on our uh, social media accounts. We also had sustainable development goal sessions. We trained teachers at the schools and we had CV uh, building workshops at the schools with the girls. So it was basically working with the teachers and the, and the school children as well to help them with understanding and realizing what they need to be working in and what they need to be involved in as well. Wonderful, that sounds so exciting. Um, building a greenhouse, creating fresh vegetables for the students. I think this is just really wonderful. What if another school in another area wants to do it? I know you already said something about finding good collaborators. What other recommendations would you have for others that may want to do this project? Definitely. Um, I just have one word or actually one piece of advice for people who are leading such projects like myself is to be open up for collaboration. Like Al Hassan mentioned that he has blueprints, which is something that I'm willing to offer as well. Any person leading such a change uh, making project should be willing to help others get to see what they did, learn from our own mistakes and help others develop a better project. It's not about stealing my thunder. It's about allowing others to create a better project than the one that I worked in in the first place. Wonderful, Latifa. That's, I think, fantastic advice. Use the blueprints that already are there. Yes, and build and on them. Build on them. People want to help. We want to help scale change. Absolutely. So now we're coming to our final uh, speaker's first intervention, and that is Belinda Simbi-Uwaze. Belinda was a scholar last year, and Belinda is a passionate activist from Rwanda who is currently pursuing her university degree in Seoul, Korea. Her SDG micro project is in partnership with her organization she founded, Glow Voice, which seeks to empower young girls in high schools in Rwanda. She believes that it is her responsibility to teach other girls how to speak up for themselves and to know their true worth so that they can unleash their full potential. So Belinda, thank you so much for joining us today. Tell us what problem did you spot in your community and how did you go about solving it? Thank you for having me, Julia. So, um... The problem that I identified in my country was that however much our government um, tries to promote women emancipation or women representation and give opportunities to women, the problem was that um, women were not taking up these opportunities. And this was because of, you know, biased traditional norms that are placed on girls when they're still young from their parents or from the family members that, you know, a woman is supposed to be placed in the house and take care of household duties. So this is the reality now where um, girls are 17, 18, they drop out of high school and get married and that's it from there. And so when I was in high school, I identified this myself. And that's how I started GLOW when I was in high school. And um, 
I realized that it's so important to tackle girls when they're in high school because the teenage years are really important in identifying who you are. It's really a critical stage in one's life where you define who you are, you define your character. So what we do is we tackle girls when they're still in high school and we mentor them, we educate them, we teach them new skills, we have volunteering activities and community work to show them that they have so, so much more to give to the society and so much more to offer and um, we teach them that they can dream and aim high and do things and that there's so much more to life than just you know being placed in a household however important that is however important that it is too but um, one should be able to dream and actually aim to achieve those dreams. Wonderful, good to hear. Um, why is this so important in, in your community? As you, you mentioned that, that there should be at least the ability to aspire to some other, other dreams, maybe not just a household dream, but is there another dream that at least more options are open? So what, what exactly, why is this so important? Why do you burn for SDG 5? Um, to put this simply, why it's important is because women matter and girls matter. They're important and they're of essence to the society. Um, if you take a look at the sustainable developmental goals, um, they aim at achieving a better future and a more sustainable future for all. So that all is not attainable if women or girls are left behind, if women or girls are not um, in, put inside that all. And if you take a look at any population, for example, the Rwandan population, which is more of women to men, and if you make an assumption that 48% um, of the men are working and actually um, generating something for the for the country and generating something for the nation. If we take an example of 45% of women who were just in households, that means that Rwanda as a country is not actually achieving 45% of its full potential. There are 45% of women who are not um, actually doing anything and not actually doing any work or generating anything for the nation. So it also applies to different contexts, whether it's socially or economically. And it also applies to different contexts as well. If you take a look in a, uh, if you look at it in a sustainable way, you know, if you look at goal number one or two, no hunger or zero poverty, if more of these women can actually uh, put in something in the economy, then these goals will also be dealt with as, as well. So it's all completely intertwined and that's why it's so important. Yes, thank you. And if someone else wants to scale or wants to replicate this type of project in a high school in their communities, uh, what would be your, your advice? My advice would definitely be, first of all, go for it. I did this when I was 17 years old. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just knew I, I wanted a change. I, I just knew I wanted girls to be able to dream and aspire and achieve. So um, my advice would be to just go for it. Um, and you do not need a lot. You don't need a lot to start. All you need is... Um, your will to actually do it and you having a mind to actually change people's lives so the first thing that i however young you are i would tell them to completely go for it that's the first thing i would tell them good advice okay now we're going to go into a lightning round of questions so you're going to have two minutes per question um, the first question goes to al hassan al hassan how did you manage to pivot and adjust your activism for the sdgs to unexpected circumstances such as the one we're living in, COVID-19. Yeah, the COVID really, you know, hit us hard, like everyone. Um, but yeah, basically, um, we were having um, weekly um, workshops in person at the hub for um, our, our beneficiaries as part of the incubator program. And so what, what we, we did was we had to pivot and, and re-strategize. And so we took it virtual. Um, in Ghana, you know, initially when, when we would have said it, this was, was not possible to, to do an, uh, a virtual incubator program in Ghana because of internet issues, power issues and all of that, but we made it work. We had four months actually of incubation. Every two weeks we were having workshops online uh, and it worked. We had to find ways of getting them internet data. We had to find ways of making sure they had stable um, you know, system to be on and all of that. And through our partnerships and collaboration uh, with Bridge for Billions, which is an online incubation platform, we also, you know, had, a, had our team, uh, our, uh, our beneficiaries also using um, the system as well. And to, to top it all, 
we actually um, did our first successful online virtual demo day where we were happy to have um, the, the Ban Ki-moon um, Center CEO, Monica, also as one of our keynote speakers. So actually it has been actually really good and we've learned a lot from it. So we will definitely um, add that also to our activities in the coming years. Wonderful. So pivoting, putting everything online. I mean, this is what we're doing today with the SDG Action Zone. Um, there's definitely lots of lots of challenges, but also some great opportunities that come with making things accessible online. Uh, so next, Oyinda, your question is, what is the biggest challenge youth need to overcome to take action for the SDGs? Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, like I said um, before, um, education, I feel like really allows a lot of the goals to align. Uh, I think Latifa also um, made a, a good case for that. I feel like the, the young generation of change makers really need a new education paradigm where we understand what it takes, you know, to develop the governance structures, the policy structures that can really lead to sustainable development. We, we need a new generation of young people that can broker global, local, regional issues that can also broker um, um, connections and collaborations between different kinds of actors, whether in civil society, um, business, um, government, young people that also understand how to balance the scientific and social aspects of sustainability. sustainability. And of course, young people that also understand um, the, the relationship between research, data, and action. So um, you're not just going off and saying, oh, this is what I want to do. It's actually driven by data, it's driven by information. So I think education really plays a strong role in preparing um, the, the current and future generation for the complex um, challenges of the 21st century. And it really allows them to take their um, future into their own end. A lack of this would be a recipe for all kinds of unrest, whether social or economic unrest. So I think prioritizing capacity building for young people um, allows for social and economic inclusion and allows young people to take their future in, in their own hands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Farida, why is the inclusion of women uh, so important for sustainable development? So not just in the context of peace, but, but why? Why is it so important? Many thanks. Good question, and at the very good time and relevant time, uh, can it relate to Afghanistan because the peace process is still uh, going on in the country. So I would say uh, the inclusion of women, whether in the peace process or any other process, is vital due to first of all, uh, if we work for the inclusion or participation of women in any in any processes, it means. It means somehow you, whether directly or indirectly, implemented some elements of the SDG number five, which is Belinda working on. So uh, within the integration of SDG number five, you do also implement other SDGs. So uh, this is the first reason. And the, another reason is that, of course, particularly when it comes to the young women, including me and including us today in this discussion, and also the scholars and fellows at the Ban Ki-moon Center. So of course, we belong at the same time to two main categories. First, the youth categories, we are also the young people. And also at the same time, luckily I would say, we also belong uh, to uh, the women category. So belonging to two main and very important categories uh, means that there, there has to be a um, huge uh, participation of of women, particularly when it comes to young women in any processes, especially in peace process, I would say. And uh, thirdly, uh, there has been so many narrative about the uh, victimization of, of women. Uh, uh, so, I mean, the participation of women and inclusion of women can help this change this narrative. So, if we tackle this problem, it means that we have changed the uh, narrative of victimization of women that so many years we have heard that women are the victim of the uh, of the war of this of, of any types of the violence or conflict 
but by our inclusion and participation, meaningful participation, somehow we can change the narrative from the victimization to the participation, to the partnership, to the collaboration, to the, uh, I would say, to the uh, inclusion. So, so Thank you, yes. let's change this narrative. <laughs> let's change the narrative, definitely. Yeah. Let's, let's move away from victimization um, and see women as actually the actual solution in a way to, to building more sustainable peace and a more sustainable world. Um, Latifa, your, your, your lightning question is, how do you make sure that your SDG micro project really reaches the beneficiaries in your community? Uh, it depends on how you look at it, who the beneficiaries are. If my beneficiaries are uh, the future generation, then I'm making sure that I'm doing so because I'm there with them. Uh, they're the ones hands-on working on the project. And if it gets um, uh, replicated in other schools, which is what I'm hoping for, then I'd make sure that the future generation are exposed to different types of um, tools that will help them with uh, in the future decide on which majors they want to, uh, to to go ahead and study when they go to university and how they would be uh, change makers themselves because you don't have to be an activist to be a change maker if you don't know how to speak in public for example but it's very also very important for them to know how they would be capable of creating change just through the, the form of study that they have. And then if the beneficiaries were uh, the school teachers and the administration, then I'm hoping that by with them seeing what we were capable of doing with collabor by collaborating with the schools, then they would be uh, like, you know what, if they were capable of doing it, if the head uh, teacher of that specific school was capable of going forward with such a project and helping empower Latifa uh, as Motani to do such a project, then why can't we as other schools do the same? So through talking about it, through uh, being accessible on different platforms is how we hope to reach others. Thank you, Latifa. Thank you. Um, and our final lightning question goes to Belinda. How would you say has being a young person made it easier or more difficult to create change? Hmm. So to be a change maker, I think being younger has made it easier. Um, change makers try to um, fight for a better future and a more sustainable future. And the fact that you are young and the fact that we are young, um, that means that the future that we're actually fighting for is our future, you know, not the older policymakers. It's actually ours. So that gives us a very high motivational factor to actually change the way things are right now because it's our future that um, we're going to live in. If you look at really young activists and change makers right now, the likes of Greta Thunberg, they are so passionate about the change that they are fighting for, and that's because it's their future, not um, the older policymakers. So. I, I believe it's a really highly motivational factor. Of course, um, there are some difficulties like looking, um, you know, you're looked down upon because you're younger, but I believe the motivational factor and the fact that you know that this is your future that you're fighting for um, definitely makes things um, much more easier, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, as we're getting to the very end, we're gonna wrap it up with um, a one sentence, finish the sentence. So thank you all so much. Before we go into the sentences, thank you for joining me today. Uh, thank you for all of your actions as global citizens um, and for joining the SDG Action Zone today. We're gonna leave our audience with this one little piece of advice or inspiration at the end. Um, so Al Hassan, the first, first we'll go to you to change the game for the SDGs. We need to co-create local solutions to achieve the goals. Perfect. For Oyinda, to change the game for the SDGs. You need to build strategic connections with other actors, sectors, and countries. Great. Farida, to change the game for the SDGs. Young people, particularly young peace builders, do not escape war but they, were, they work uh, to make war escape them. Thank you. Latifa, to change the game for the SDGs. Be perceptive, collaborate with others, and be the change. Just do it. Great. And Belinda, the last word to change the game for the SDGs. Uplift a woman to uplift a nation. 
Wonderful. Thank you all so much. A big round of applause. And um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Yeah.